Yeah, welcome once again to Breaker Room 3, European citizens from East and West. Uh, as you have heard in the plenary, we are going to start with a presentation from Hune Holmgard Anderson. And I would directly hand over to you, Hune. Feel free to share your screen if you want to. Yes, I would like to do so. Uh, hello, hello from Oslo. It's such a nice thing that uh, the global village is coming together again, even though we have to do it on Zoom. Um, so I'm just going to see if I can get this working. I think so. Yeah, this doesn't look so fancy, but can you see my presentation here? Yes, wonderful. Okay. So today um, I'm starting with, with a presentation on, on barriers in the Western Eastern European relationship. Um, this is a very interesting question, uh, especially because it's been divided into three different questions. So now I have to see whether I can move this one. Yes. So, um, so I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about what do Europe Eastern Europeans think about Western Europeans and the other way around, and what are the differences between East and the West, and what are the barriers, barriers in this relationship? Um, these questions are very, very large, so I hope that I could uh, answer at least a little bit of those. Um, but my presentation would be mostly oriented towards some kind of discussion afterwards, especially after we've had Martin's uh, presentation too. Um, so. Uh, first of all, yes, my name is Rune Holmgo Andersen. Uh, sorry for that. Um, I'm basically a Dane, having lived for 15 years in Estonia, um, doing my PhD too there. Um, worked for a year in the US. Um, been working in, in Denmark, as we've said, uh, in your, your introduction. And now I'm sitting in Oslo. Um, we are approaching winter too here. So <laughs> there was one complaining about the, the weather in, in, in Kiev. It's not so warm here either. So, um, but I've been asked uh, to do a presentation, I guess, because I was a guest editor of uh, a special issue uh, of the Norwegian Foreign Policy Institute's uh, journal Nordisk Ost Forum, the Norwegian Eastern, uh, the Nordic Eastern Forum. Um, unfortunately, uh, this journal is uh, written in Scandinavian, which is very nice for those who understand the uh, Scandinavian, but it might be a little bit too difficult to access if you don't. Um, but this special um, issue uh, was about what is actually East and West. Do we still have these kind of are these categories still relevant if, if they've ever been so? Um, and it consists of five different um, articles. Uh, one by me, uh, which was an introduction and a postscript, um, which simply just asked what happened to the East. And you can read that the way you want. Uh, and then there was a, a contribution about uh, family values in, in Eastern Europe or and in Western Europe. Um, the third one was on uh, mental uh, well-being in East and West, um, investigating into loneliness and depression. The, third, uh, the fourth contribution was on economic growth, uh, across the uh, post-Soviet and, and uh, Western Europe and, and uh, East Central Europe. And the last contribution was on uh, party systems, stability of party systems. So, well, one, one can approach the, the, the East-West question from, from different angles. Um, I would have loved to have more, more aspects um, included, but I think that makes well, we somehow got around uh, the topic. Um, so, why is it actually important to talk about East and West? Well, from the from 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 the side of the ivory tower where I'm, I like to see myself sitting, um, it's simply interesting just just to know 
uh, whether we have some kind of a re regional, we have two regions, so whether it is actually worth talking about East and West. From a more practical um, side, well, we are neighbors, uh, even, even if we're sitting uh, to the west of the east or, or where we are sitting. Um, and east and west are, well, it, it's, it's, some, it's, a, it's a topic where, where you find a lot of prejudices, uh, where reality is, well, we don't know very much about each other. We, we tend to build up stereotypes and we have fears and dreams about each other. Um, so know each other, it's probably a pre precondition for, for having a peaceful coexistence. Um, some have talked about that we might see a class of civilizations where we 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 end up end up in conflict with each other. But well, who knows? Um, and at, at least it's it's very important that we know whether we are alike or whether we are different from each other. Um, we also have tended to use these East and Western concepts as a kind of mirror to 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 define how, who we are ourselves and where we want to go and where we perhaps. Do not want to go. So, looking into differences between East and Europe, East and West, well, it's probably essential if we want to understand any kind of barriers between East and Western European um, relationships. If we want to cooperate, uh, if we we don't understand why we don't cooperate that much, um, I think we we need to look into these differences. And that can, might be all kinds of differences. There might be uh, value differences. There might be differences within ec economics and political systems. Um, so I, I would try to, to, to dive a little bit into that. And, and I hope we'll have to, uh, the chance to discuss it in, in further details. So what is East and what is West? Well, it's, it's, it's not very clear because some, some Eastern European countries, or at least those that we, we tend to see, say it's east or they are actually situated west of, of some western western countries um so it, it it's probably something else than just geography so but a first first approximation to this would be to ask what is a region um, because if if we are talking about east and west we are talking about regions and there was are many ways to define that but i think one way to define the region might be to, to say that it has to be something about that we have to look more like each other within the region that we look uh, towards others, that we have internal homogeneity and external heterogeneity. So that we are defined both as the way we are alike and the way we are different from others. Um, the East-West divide has a very deep history. Uh, that's why as I, 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 in this heading, say that we have deep, deep and recent history of two, perhaps, regions. Um, but at least from, from, from the Western side, um, this division goes back to the Enlightenment, um, probably back to Voltaire, um, where Western scholars have seen or what's we would say it being Western scholars has said has, has defined East and West as some kind of each other's uh, mutual mirrors. That East is a somehow mirror inferior mirror of the West. It's somehow like us, but it's still not quite like us. Um, and I think that is some kind of an idea that that has carried over, over to to the present day. Um, it also have a more recent um, history uh, as a kind, of, a kind of rubric from the communist of Cold, Cold War times, um, the, the Iron Curtain dividing East and West, the communist world and the so-called free world. Um, that is, even though it's, well, I do remember the, the fall of, of of um, the Berlin Wall, but um, luckily most students don't, do, don't remember that these days. Um, so, but but it's a kind of mental picture that we still have. Um, 
and then the question is, are there any kind of structural reality that divides these, the, the continent into to, to two parts, and the Western and the Eastern part? Um, and I think there are, are reasons to say that, that, that there might be some kind of an East-West div division of, of um, the continent, continent that still remains. Though one should be careful of not just saying East and West, because uh, that should be important qualifications. It's not, it's not clear where East and West is, even though we might find differences. And then there's um, East and West as a kind of um, shorthand, a political tool that can be used uh, in the political discourse. Um, if one reads Western media um, or pundits have been into to official discussions of East and West, you would normally see that there's kind of general negative connotation about uh, the East. Um, success stories in, in, in public media would normally be seen as the odd case out. Um, the West, on the other hand, has been kind of seen as an ideal in the in the East, at least initially after the, the, the breakdown of communism. There's been this kind of feeling that we, we have to normalize history, that we that many of, of these, these countries at least have had this feeling that they, they've been put into the wrong category. At least I've, I've been living for 15 years in, in Estonia and, and, and they, they are very, very certain that they, they, they have been put into the wrong category. Um, and we've seen some a kind of competition about being, being the most Western country, outdoing uh, one's, one's neighbors. Um, and there's been a competition about moving the east, uh, west east border to the, towards the east, saying that we are in the west and, and somebody might be still remain in the east. So there's also been kind of negative connotations uh, surrounding um, east. Uh, and then, then we've seen some kind of newer um, developments, um, probably some kind of um, reactions to, to the fact that, that many post-communist countries have not been able to, to reach the levels of, of the West yet. Um, so, so we've seen this value change in some countries where where the West has changed from being the ideal to moving over to be kind of seen as, as a moral degraded um, area, decadent, um, and East as as a savior of, of the real Western or European values. Um, there's been ideas that Ro uh, Russia should act as the third Rome, saving saving Europe. Um, and you see in Poland and Hungary and Russia and, and other places that you have this new pan-European liberal, anti-liberal populism. That's kind of nostalgia for the ideal idealized uh, imagined past. Um, I think that that's, well, I think these kind of, of um, values might be seen as, as a reaction to, to, to this, that you, you have not been, been accepted by the West as, as, as an equal partner. I'm just going to try to move my own picture here. So, um, oops. So, the, the, ah, okay. Maybe only a quick interruption, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we are already having the uh, 10 minutes, so I don't know how much you Okay, have yes. Have so, I'll just make it very short. So, but there are some facts here that the West, on average, is more democratic than the East. Um, though we've seen great variation within East. Um, the West, on average, are more affluent than the East, though we also see great variation within the East and, and we will have different attractions so that some are heading very much towards the West and Western standards and others are falling behind. Um, we see stronger family values in the, in the East and in the West. The family is still much more important. Uh, how do you help your, your, your parents or your uh, 
children. Elderly in, in the East have a tendency to be more lonely and more depressed. That might be because they, they might lose their family or feel that they, they are a burden for the family. Um, Eastern democracies have had a tendency to be less stable than Western democracies. You have more new parties coming in, um, but we also see some kind of um, converging, convergence so that the West is becoming more unstable. Uh, and oops, um, the West have more liberal values than, than the East, which have more traditional values. That's, well, for instance, religion is much more important. Uh, it's much more so that, that you have an assertion that your, your own culture has, uh, is uh, superior. You're less prone to accept sex, uh, same-sex marriages and abortion in, in the East and in the West. So we have these, these kind of value differences too. So I will stop here, I think, um, yeah. Um, no, no, maybe you could... Yeah. Yeah, I think it's nice to hear also your summary thoughts, but yes. uh, yeah. Um, so I think it would be very interesting if we could somehow discuss what, well, if we, if we look, what to, to see what, what kind of barriers there are, I think we should look into what, 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 what is it actually the, the basis should be for the corporation? What are the benefits that we should seek? And um, are the, these kind of benefits or, or, of corporation, are they mutual? Um, we are different. And but but are we are we to cooperate on an equal footing, or or is it so that that one side should be cooperating more, or or initiating more, or paying for it? Um, and which aspects or which areas should we be should we cooperate within? Um, should it be within economics, politics, um, civil society, environment? Uh, should it be cultural and, uh, exchange, mobility, or tourism, or, or what is it actually that we should cooperate? in um despite our our, our our differences and and the the, the things that we share uh, so so that's actually my my contribution here for, at least for the for, for the time being okay yeah thank you so much Muna. it was very in interesting thank you for the insights i would directly hand over to martin um as discussed i i show your presentation martin right thank you um yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening to everybody. Hello from uh, Stalbunev in Rivno Oblast in Ukraine. Uh, my name is Martin, Martin Reuter. Uh, I've been living in Ukraine since 2008. The last uh, six years I was working in different projects of uh, German development cooperation. And since last year I work uh, as an independent consultant in Ukraine here, I'm working with uh, the Kromadas here, with the local territorial communities and also with local businesses and universities. And I also run uh, the NGO Multicultural Ukraine. It was founded in 2009 in Kharkiv and last year uh, we moved to Stalbunov because I moved to Stalbunov. And now our headquarters are here in Salbunev, and uh, we have projects all over Ukraine, but the focus for now is Volin region. That's uh, a big region here in Western Ukraine. And you can see here uh, our team. It's also uh, multicultural. Uh, we do have a volunteer uh, from the United States, uh, States who is based in Kiev. Uh, Chris, uh, we have um, Alona in Kharkiv region and our core team, Alexander, Ina and uh, me here in uh, Salbunev. Yeah. Next slide, please. And uh, our mission, well, I try to make the slides a bit uh, um, colorful and emotional. Yeah, so our mission if to say in one sentence is local development through exchange and uh, cooperation. Because we all love Ukraine, we want to help Ukraine to develop and we are convinced uh, if, if um, 
we want Ukraine to develop, we need to focus on uh, rural space and countryside because uh, big cities, they are developing um, on their own but uh, the, the countryside is thinking uh, behind. Of course, because of a lack of uh, infrastructure and let's say manpower, uh, active people with uh, the needed skills to uh, push and to bring their regions and their concrete uh, small towns or villages uh, forward. So we want to help these people and organizations uh, administrations um, in rural um, Ukraine. And uh, we want to help them uh, by uh, helping them uh, to uh, explore their multicultural potential. That's why we are called multicultural Ukraine, because we, we strongly believe that there is a tremendous uh, multicultural potential uh, which is not uh, properly used uh, by the stakeholders um, uh, in this um, regions. And we identified actually uh, three main sources of, multicul of multicultural potential um, unused or not used in the way uh, as it would be effective. Uh, the first source is the multicultural heritage. Uh, here, here I am talking about um, Polish, Jews, Czechs, Germans, for instance, who lived uh, in, former, in former times in Ukraine, and they are their descendants abroad mainly now, and uh, this potential is not used, these bridges are not built in the amount it should be. And uh, that's where we are helping uh, to do this. The, the second pool of multicultural potential are foreigners in Ukraine, like expats, like me, for instance, students, tourists uh, coming to Ukraine. Each person uh, coming to Ukraine uh, is a person with a certain uh, background, with uh, potential knowledge, skills, uh, of course, not all of them, but many of them would be willing to share with someone, but uh, very seldom there are proposals or possibilities for them to do so. And we propose uh, to our partners to work more with um, experts, foreigners living in the region, because um, I will in the next slide show actually what I mean with this. And the third pool, of course, are the Ukrainians abroad, the so-called um, diaspora. So um, if we talk about a village in Western Ukraine and they are always crying, oh, we have no partners abroad, but actually uh, half, of, half of the population does live abroad. So uh, there's the question why we do not use the population abroad to build some bridges uh, between uh, uh, villages and um, countries. Next slide. So uh, what are we doing uh, just to give some examples uh, about our projects uh, in this year? Uh, we have accreditation of European Voluntary Service. It's now called European Solidarity Corps, this program of Erasmus Plus. And we are sending volunteers abroad, but uh, are also hosting volunteers. Um, well, we did, of course, a po uh, we, we did a break now because of uh, COVID, but uh, we, we plan from next year on again to host volunteers. And we want to focus uh, again on, a multi on multicultural heritage. For instance, um, when there is a village where in former times was um, a Czech uh, settlement where lived many people from Czech, uh, from Czechia, the so-called Volin Czech, uh, so we want to invite a volunteer from Czech Republic to come to Ukraine to a concrete village 
and to help us to and to help this local village to uh, set up this um, communication background uh, to build up these relations between uh, Czech Republic and Ukraine. So volunteer uh, programs, of course, are a great instrument uh, to uh, tackle yeah, uh, with this uh, East-West uh, thing that uh, that Rune mentioned uh, in his uh, short lecture, uh, the uh, the um, uh, meetup pro program and the House of Europe grant, they are quite well known in Ukraine. I think everybody working in Ukraine uh, knows these two grants. Uh, we uh, were fortunately also granted uh, this year. We had a virtual uh, school exchange with uh, Germany, Turkey, uh, and Ukraine. And now we are working uh, on the sustainability. Of course, we want that uh, this is not a one, um, um, a one way or um, how to say, uh, not one way, uh, Einweg, um, one time uh, wonder. Yeah, we want to make it sustainable. And now we uh, talk with our partners uh, to make this sustainable. And a very nice project we had, uh, it's just finishing, it's called Youth Bridge uh, by Dejev Vakovici. A very interesting project. It's related to history uh, after World War II, when uh, Ukrainians living in the border region of Poland and Slovakia uh, were forced uh, to move to Ukraine to Soviet Ukraine. There was a, there was an agreement between uh, Czechoslovakia and uh, Soviet Ukraine, and these people uh, from Ukraine uh, came uh, to Ukraine. But in Ukraine, they were seen as Slovaks and Western people, and in Slovakia, they were seen as Ukrainians, Eastern people. So uh, very interesting history, and this history actually um, is not um, explored and discovered and researched at all in Ukraine, and uh, many, uh, uh, very few people are talking about this. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's um, a very good um, thing for the villages and cities where these people lived uh, to use this again for cooperation with Slovakia. And we did uh, this try with uh, Bardejov, uh, which is maybe, you know, a beautiful city in Eastern Ukraine. And now there is this kind of partnership between Bardejov, uh, Bardejov and Vakovici. And we hope, uh, we hope that uh, our partners uh, they will continue uh, to be friends and to build this um, uh, youth bridge further. Next slide. Yeah, here I will be very short. We got granted now by US Embassy in Ukraine and we will uh, implement a very interesting project. Uh, our initiative, uh, it's about organic agriculture in um, uh, in vocational education, yeah, and that's a very important uh, that's a very important issue, and it's actually uh, also related to rural development because uh, when we uh, want to develop rural space, of course, people have to work, they have to find uh, jobs, and agriculture, of course, is nice. But um, organic culture or agriculture is uh, much more interesting because these products can be uh, uh, sold for a higher amount of money. And um, there, are more, uh, there are many interesting uh, stakeholders involved in this organic agriculture business. And uh, we are happy to realize this project uh, now. And the last slide, please. I come back now to these uh, sources um, of uh, multicultural potential. You see on the left, this uh, huge card of Volin. That's the historical region here in Ukraine, uh, in Western Ukraine. And uh, it's interesting that this card, uh, this map, sorry, this map actually was designed uh, by uh, a descendant of German settlers 
who lives now in America. Actually, he never was in the uh, uh, in Ukraine up to now. But it shows that people living abroad thinking each day about Ukraine and about villages in Ukraine because they have their roots uh, here. And I am now in contact with this a guy. His name, him, his name is Rod. And uh, I brought him in contact uh, with uh, the people uh, from the villages uh, where um, his roots are. I found uh, at the local schools people knowing English which is very important because uh, one main barrier, of course, it's always related uh, to, uh, um, to the uh, non-knowledge of foreign languages, especially uh, in Ukraine, uh, very few people and very few pupils, unfortunately, uh, they know English or they are taught well in English. That's a big uh, problem. So this map, it's an example. Uh, how uh, we will now uh, foster cooperation between a village in Ukraine and a people, a village to, to be found uh, in the US uh, on the fundament of this common, uh, common sorry, history. Yeah, and the other photos, the other pictures, again, they are, they are about foreign students. There are about 60,000 uh, foreign students in Ukraine. And of course, uh, each student, uh, it's a source uh, for possible um, cooperation. Yeah, it's not only about making friends, but friendship, of course, it's in general at, at the beginning, but it's indeed about building bridges uh, for future. And currently we do not use that, that, that potential. And the map below, uh, shows uh, where all over the world um, are living Ukrainians. Uh, I have now communication with Portugal and with Ukrainian diaspora there. I plan to, 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 uh, to get in contact. Um, and it's very interesting. Uh, um, Ukrainians are, um, are everywhere. And there's also uh, um, an intelligentsia abroad, people uh, to work with, people with contacts. Uh, and it's very interesting. And I think that also the local administrations do not see yet this potential for, uh, for projects. Because at the end, uh, nowadays, uh, if you want to uh, realize a project, if, if you want to submit a project proposal, uh, most of the donors, no, of course, it depends on the project uh, uh, and the call, but most of the donors and the projects, uh, they, uh, they ask for uh, partners abroad. So if you don't have partners abroad, then you cannot realize interesting projects. And most of the um, villages and small cities uh, in, in rural Ukraine, they do not have partners yet abroad and we help them uh, to find these partners uh, using the, multi the multicultural potential I tried to describe. So that's my last slide. I have one more slide um, just to say a thank you because of course it's a big pleasure for me uh, to be with you together. Uh, of course, I do not know most of the people here in this um, participants list, but uh, if you have any interest uh, to work with Ukraine, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to build bridges and to, to implement interesting initiatives uh, for rural and local development, feel free to contact me and my team, and I will be happy to continue with your communication. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for this nice practical insight. Uh, I'd say now it's time for the, for the open discussion. As I said, feel free. Um, to share your thoughts. I see that we already have a lot uh, in the chat. Um, also, if you want to speak up, you can write not only in the chat, you can also use uh, Zoom's reaction function, raise your hand or just unmute yourself. This also works. <laughs> um, maybe let's start with one question from the, from the chat. I think the first question from Frank was, right, where 
exactly does east start and end and where exactly does west start and end? Yeah, well, I guess that's that's my question. Uh, th that's the question for me. Um, and I'm not really um, in a very good position of giving a, a good answer for that. Um, because it's very much this uh, a perception of, of, of a division of, of the continent. Um, well, well, in, in the, in, for, for this, this session, we were talking about Eastern and Western Europe, but but yeah, okay. Where where does Europe end? Um, go to Ukraine? No, no, no. Um, George and and ask them: Are you European or are you from Asia? Um, you'll probably get the, the question, the answer that no, we are from Europe. Even though, if you look at the map, Georgia would probably belong to to Asia. Um, and and I think what this special issue of 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 the Nordic East Forum showed that is that you have some kind of division or, or there are differences across the continent, but you also have very many shades of, of these uh, these differences and they don't really overlap. Um, for instance, um, um, the paper on, on family relations would say that, yeah, we'll, we'll have a East-West division, but it's probably going from North uh, northwest to to southeast, not east west. Um, so it's 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 maps in the minds, not not on 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 populist maps, though though maps are political too in that sense. Um, I remember from my my childhood, uh, which was before the the breakdown of communism and and the fall of the Berlin Wall, that Eastern Europe. On my my maps, we really looked like the the backside of the moon. Um, we really didn't know much about what was on the other side. And and when the the, the Berlin Wall fall, um, we were looking at each other and and seeing um, seeing humans on the other side too. Um, that had two legs and two arms and and looked very much like we did. And perhaps we we do share a lot of things. Uh, so exactly where 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 the division is. I don't know. Um, it's very much how people themselves see it, see it, how it is. We can see that different countries have different levels of economic growth and, and affluence. We can see that there are differences in, in the political party system stability. We can see that there are differences in, in family norms and then we can see that, that elderly people tend to be more depressed uh, the, the further you get to the west or the east than being in the west. Uh, but I, 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 would, I would tend not to, to draw a, a line um, from 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 north to south, to dividing this this continent into two parts. Um, yeah. Thank you, Luna. We have a comment also from Dara regarding this. Uh, that Chizek also wrote about this issue of of locating Europe. Thank you for sharing the link, Terry. Uh, you're welcome. Just a little interesting uh, article on it, like <laughs> saying that people always, um, yeah, uh, depends where you're located, where you try and define what is Europe <laughs> and what is not. Um, I just have to go into the other room now, I'm afraid, but be in touch. And thanks for the lovely uh, speeches. It was very um, interesting stuff. And um, sorry, I have to leave. <laughs> be in touch. All right. Bye. Bye. Frank, do you want to, to comment directly on this question, East and West, where is it? Um, are you, uh, uh, did you ask me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, uh, you raised your hand. Uh, okay, um, I'd like to pick up on the last point that Rona mentioned that maybe we are just more similar and that we are different. I mean, first of all, aren't we humans, every one of us? And we, we have some needs, you know, we need, we need safety, we need certainty, we need to belong. To, to, to some groups, uh, we need to feel valued. Um, we need to grow in, in some respects, in different respects, and uh, we need some variety in our lives and we need to contribute. I think we're more, we're more similar than we're different. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I think uh, I would say that differences might be a source of 
conflict, but it doesn't have to be a, a source of conflict. Um, I, I don't feel strange when I'm traveling to some, some I don't know, yeah, Ukraine or something, though the culture looks very much different from what, what I'm used to. Um, so, yeah, well, 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 but but I think this this fact that you don't know your peer that might be the the the, the main impediment to to cooperation, that you have some kind of an idea about how your your peer looks like, but you don't really know. So you have all kind of yeah, um, we have this tendency to see that people in the West they they probably uh, so extremely happy and um so affluent uh, they don't have any problems and people in the west would tend to see that well you just have problems all over the place uh, everything got, uh, smells of cabbage uh, well i i think that that's that's one of the main impediments to to cooperation between east and west um so and one other thing that that i think might be a problem is that that there's this idea that that the west should be the donor and and east should be the receiver um perhaps the east need to to convince the west that they have a kind of interest in, in cooperation not because east needs cooperation but because west should be able to learn something or or, or gain something from from cooperation so is that some kind of a uh, an answer Yes, very good. I mean, that's why I suggested this. Uh, how do we innovate? Because I, as I understand it, you know, our history in in the Western part of Europe is uh, we've been really good at innovating, haven't we? Uh, all kinds of products and, and our societies, and uh, that's created a lot of uh, economic growth for us. And yeah. Mm. Well, I think one one thing, well, well I, I'm just studying economic transition too and 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 I at least the way I see it that is that economic development is very much dependent on whether you have good institutions uh, if you are afraid that your neighbor would steal whatever you you innovate or produce then you wouldn't produce anything or innovate anything and I think the fall of communism left east without good institutions. They, they didn't have good institutions beforehand, but they might have been better than no institutions. Um, and some countries have been very, very good at, at building up institutions that gives people incentives to innovate. Um, I've lived in one of these countries for 15 years. Um, I think Ukraine might have failed in this respect, as uh, would I would say Moldova too, or, um, and Georgia. They they have a much bigger potential than what they are able to realize because they have they have incentive problems, um, and you would see that reflected in the fact that that things doesn't work. You don't have services that that you need. Uh, you don't have uh secured uh property rights you have all kind of uh, red tape you have corruption which is a major blocking stone for innovation um at least that that's that's the way i see it um but that might not be so much of an east west problem um though though the problem is mainly pertaining to to the east right now um but but yeah, if if you want to have economic development, I think that is the 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 key area that you should attack is building up good institutions. There are many of those who are in a position to build up these institutions who are not have an incentive to do so because that would dry out the source of income. Um, you could probably look at Ukrainian politicians in that respect. So I see Claudia also has her hand. Prison. Claudia, would you like to comment or? Yeah, I was just thinking that. Um, so, hello from Bucharest, Romania. Uh, we are uh, Eastern Europe very much, but we are also European Union very much. Um, and um, for us, you know, Ukraine is a little bit 
at the top of the Ukraine with the top of Romania, it's have to be west. <laughs> so there are regions that we need we look a little bit on to northwest to look to Ukraine. So east-west, it's it's very problematic if you look at Europe at a whole. Um, and uh, you mentioned Georgia, Armenia as well. Um, those those countries are um, and the Republic of Moldova. You mentioned those are not part of European Union. Um, so I think um, there's another layer in the east-west discussion that has to do with the community, the European Community. Um, really being mindful about the, the differences, uh, historical differences and historical struggles that uh, the, the different regions of Europe have been going through. And you mentioned uh, institutions, and this is where the innovation, I would answer Frank's question. Uh, that's my uh, field of expertise. And I'm going to bring you one institution to the table uh, uh, because I really wanted to bring it in discussions when we talk about Ukraine and other East European countries. And these institutions are public libraries. Uh, if we talk about public libraries to any person from the Western Europe, they think about nice buildings, uh, resources, uh, free resources for the communities and uh, like any citizens ha have the right to use that resource. If you talk about public libraries in Eastern Europe, though, you might get surprised to know that people don't know where the public library is, even though they have public libraries. The ex-communist uh, uh, influence area did build uh, many public libraries, but those institutions who are, I think, um, uh, at the cornerstone of democrat democratic communities uh, have been left, as you said, uh, you know, alone. Uh, and um, the reality 20 years after the fall of communism, because, you know, I know we are keep bringing the historical uh, past here with us at the table, but it's been, you know, so many years. <laughs> Since then, uh, things did change. There were projects, there were um, attempts to, to uh, bridge the, the gap, to unite the, these uh, regions of Europe. Um, so we cannot talk about changes at the system level at, in public libraries, but there are uh, communities who have strong public libraries. And I'm, I'm working now in Ukraine with a, a library association uh, um, who is very, very professional, very strong, uh, and who is innovating in terms of what type of services public libraries are offering, both in urban and rural communities. So Martin, I really, really hope you're working with some public libraries in your projects uh, because they are doing a great job. Uh, but the job that they do, it's with a lot of extra struggle compared to librarians from Western uh, Europe. So innovation would be if we would actually provide some support and resources to innovative local ideas from to librarians, for example, this is my example, but I'm sure there are other institutions that know the community, that know, you know, uh, the needs and could really be effective in, uh, in uh, bridging uh, the, the differences in uh, talking about multiculturalism in a constructive way, in uh, debugging the fake news about uh, other parts of, uh, of Europe. We have, for example, from the European perspective, um, um, European information centers that are all over the European Union. And a few of them in Romanian case are built in the public library. And it's interesting because when we talk about, you know, where would be a good place to learn about European Union, uh, very few pe people say public library. You know, how about TV or websites or whatever, but actually education needs to be helped, needs to be um, uh, supported in an environment that actually uh, is there for the community, not just one-time projects, not the one-time investments. Um, and so the, the big difference between East and West from my perspective is that we, we say the same words, but we mean different things. And the example of public library is one, one such example, right? So in any project we talk if, uh, with the members of European Parliament, for example, and they are from Western countries, and I'm, we talk about, you know, the need for public libraries, like, but you have public libraries, you know, the numbers are there, they should be doing, they are not doing what you know as public service in the Western countries, uh, Western more traditional uh, countries. And I really, just, just to wrap up the statistic about um, 
democratic uh, stability. I think you mentioned, uh, Rune, I'm not sure how, how was it was framed, um, that it's more stable in the Western countries and the, 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 their variation within the Eastern European countries. The innovators who are really supporting the democratic communities uh, in the Western um, in the Eastern countries, we are working currently with Ukraine, Republic of Moldova, Romania, of course, and Armenia. The innovators have the same struggles, really. You know, they are struggling to, to build their capacity, to be heard, to have uh, support and visibility. Um, so it's the differences are not as big as we fear they are, but the intervention needs to be local. And connecting with local communities, I think it's the key to, to better understanding and bridging the differences and not being afraid to innovate, to, to um, invest in ideas that you know, might not work, but are created by local communities. Um, this is our secret. We are, <laughs> we are doing at the Progress Foundation. We would like to share the secret with more people. So if you know more librarians or more NGOs who would like to work with librarians, I would love to, to talk more about this. Yeah, thank you so much, Claudia. Very interesting to hear, hear about it and hear to, to hear about your work. And it's also yeah, nice to see that we have like also those two positions, right, in this in this room, like on the one, one hand side. And we are kind of all the same. And on the other hand side, you say, yeah, there are differences and words mean different things and so on. And we were already all um, diving into the question of, of Frank as well, who wrote in the chat uh, about the question of cooperation from, from Rune, right? Um, what are the, what are the What is the basis of cooperation and how do we innovate? Um, yes, and I think this is a question to all of you. So yeah, maybe there are some, some more thoughts about it. And when, uh, yeah, okay. Maybe Martin, you want to comment on it. <laughs> I, can, I can just say one little thing that um, uh, talking about cooperation, of course, always means that uh, people have to know about each other. And uh, in my experience, there's always, unfortunately, a lack of information uh, about um, partners in Ukraine. And uh, if we talk about uh, villages and small cities um, looking for partners abroad, uh, they are always or often uh, often surprised uh, why they do not get answers to their mails or letters uh, they are sending. And actually, um, very often, uh, even these organizations, administrations, uh, they do not have any information about themselves uh, online in English language. Or even if they have, uh, these uh, Wikipedia articles are so poor and so horribly written and so uh, horrible uh, photos were chosen that, of course, it's very difficult to interest, uh, to, uh, to, yeah, to make someone interested uh, abroad uh, to cooperate uh, with this uh, certain entity. So um, I think uh, when we talk about cooperation, uh, it's about information, uh, first of all, and about communication. So um, communication, that's already this, this intercultural uh, element of East and West. There are indeed um, some differences uh, remaining. So uh, information, communication, and cooperation. That's the thing, I think. Thank you, Martin. Somebody else wants to share thoughts on, on this question or we should move to another one? Well, well I, I think at least that if, if we talk about this cooperation between East and West, I think partners in, in Eastern Europe needs to think about uh, the question, what is in it for, for the Western partners? Um, because well, I, I've been involved in, in a lot of these kind of projects too, and but it, but it tends to be that that Eastern part, partners want help for something or or finance for something, um, not 
not the other way around that it should become from from the west to the east but 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 in some sense if, if it should be an equal cooperation and and if if eastern eastern partners want to to be more successful i think they they, they need to, to somehow think about what what should they offer for the west um but 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 I think Martin is, is is very correct in this that that it is important to 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 make connections because you you have all kind of of ideas in in the east and the west what what the other ones look like and and can we really cooperate can we really contribute to anything for, uh, and can we really learn something um, so so I think that that is one of one of the main ideas or, or, or important things that 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 if you want to have cooperation, it should be on, on an equal footing. That that everybody should be be having some kind of benefit, um, and that is something that, from my experience, that is sometimes forgotten. If Thank I you. May, if I may answer to this, just just a thought. Um, I know it's very frustrating. I've spent a lot of time in the United States and coming back to Romania. It was a hard time figuring out that you know you always ask for help from eastern europe but um the truth is um in a community people help each other and um there i just saw a meme on facebook saying you know um if somebody says they are depressed you have to believe them because if if uh, people ask for help they actually need help um, from a Romanian perspective, for example, once Romania joined European Union, we were considered a democratic state with strong institutions, which is not the case. And if you at the table of negotiation consider Romania, you know, equal partner, which we want to be considered, but you don't look at, for example, the low number of women in politics, and you, the same thing in Pol Poland, for example, Right. Um, the right of women, uh, you consider they are safe there because, you know, it's a democratic country. Uh, and people from the country say, you know, actually, no, we need help. Uh, and we keep hearing, you know, but what do you bring to the table? Uh, we bring uh, people who need help. Uh, and once we were, uh, they're part of European Union, you know, this kind of, from our perspective, uh, was accepted by the other partners. The Part, uh, countries who are not part of Eastern European uh, of European Union, I think they, they it's even the situation is even more serious because uh, they are not even considered partners in terms of geopolitical negotiation. So the social issues that are there, and you know, when the brave people have the guts to talk about them openly, uh, and the answer is well, but what do you bring to the table really? Then people will stop asking for help. And uh, that's not what we want. We really want people to be able to say what they need and, you know, to the best of our abilities, actually help. From our, our perspective, for example, we saw in Ukraine so many courageous um, citizen um, activities that uh, fight for dem democracy sometimes more uh, more so than in Romanian case. Uh, I'm not I'm not an expert on corruption, but I can tell you the corruption in Romania uh, it's it's quite bad and we are a European uh, a part of European Union. so that's not a problem that can be openly addressed really. Um, so there are this all these small issues that um, are problematic. But I really, really find it hard to listen to say, you know, we need to explain to our partners, to people who say they are interested in, you know, well-being at European level, why we need support. Uh, the example of public libraries. Again, imagine you would not have functional public libraries in your country. Just imagine not having it at all, right? Would that be something? you know, that would affect your quality of life? I believe so. So helping Ukraine, uh, Republic of Moldova, Romania, having better libraries, uh, it will not benefit your life now, but can benefit your life when you come visit our, our countries or when you do projects or when you talk with people from Ukraine and explain them, you know, how useful a public library is and they actually know how, how that works. 
Um, and I'm sorry if I seem a little bit too emotional about this, but it's been a number of times since I heard this. Uh, and I used to think the same thing, but now knowing how much people uh, really struggle. Um, we had a joke in our foundation that um, when the pandemic hit, uh, everybody was hit very hard, right? Um, but you should look at libra libraries, for example, from Ukraine and Romania and see how innovative those people were without any pay, without any technology and without any investment, right? The quality of services during the pandemic uh, were at the level of Western countries. And that's because we innovated and the people really innovated with what they had. And the hit was, um, um, it had hit everyone, right? So there was no difference. Now you were hit a little bit harder. We were, at the beginning, we all were hit equally. And we were able in Eastern Europe to really provide quality services on you know, the niche that I'm, I, I know of. Um, so I'm guessing this should be the case in other, other fields and other institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Frank, you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, that's exactly uh, what you mentioned, Claudia, why I passed on this uh, positive deviance method. As I understand the method, uh, it's like you, you, you look at the people in a neighborhood and maybe there's one family who is, who is sort of doing better than all the others, but with the same resources. And you find out as research, what's going on here? And um, what are they doing differently in this family? And then you start from there because you can share that information uh, with everyone. And then people will see, well, the mother in that family maybe is t making sure that um, everyone washes his or her hands or it's clean in the, it's clean in the house or uh, they're just doing things some, somehow differently than the others, but with the same resources. Um, so you start actually from, from where people are instead of pushing something from the west to the east that they maybe not, do not need. Thank you. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe another question we haven't uh, discussed yet. Is there anything you think the EU should do regarding uh, Eastern and Western European relationship? Well, I guess it all depends on what what you which aim to you you have, um, and I guess the EU do a lot of things uh, through the partnerships uh, programs and, um, but yeah, some, somehow getting getting back to this um, that, that Claudia said to to point that that yes. You 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 should help in the in the family in the community, but 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 if people do not feel that they are in a community with between east and east and west, um, then there might be a problem of of convincing them that they should help. Um, and in in some senses, this east west mental map idea still persists that that. That from from the west to east is something it is something like like we are, but it's something different. And and are they part of us or are they not? Um, so, but yeah, um, I, I think we we can all be in agreement that 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 it would be good to to help east if if they have problems, but. But we are some, somehow perhaps sitting in a, in the egg rooms because we are all interested in, in east and west. Um, but ordinary people in, in the west might not care that much about it, and like people in, in in the east might not care that much about what what happens in in the west. Um, so that that was what I, I was bringing up. 
that if if, if you if you if you need help, you you should tell why you need it. Uh, what what is the benefit for for those that that should provide it? Uh, if it's not some kind of cooperation on on equal footing, so where everybody benefits from this cooperation. Uh, and I think there, there are very many areas where where East and West should and could uh, cooperate much better, both within economics and and culture, uh, politics. Um, we probably have some some problems about the global warming that that needs uh, fixing, and we probably need, should cooperate on that too. Um, so. Yeah, thank you very much, Munem. We are also already coming close to the, to the end of this uh, session and this webinar. Maybe we can make a short uh, closing round, like one by one, who wants to share uh, what you want to see in the future of Europe regarding the, the relationship of Eastern and Western Europe. Maybe just one or two sentences, if you would like to. Maybe Martin, you could start. Well, uh, I know uh, from the past, from history, uh, when uh, the German settlers uh, left Ukraine um, and also Ukrainians, uh, there were agencies um, in Ukraine uh, and these agencies, they promoted uh, this better life abroad, for instance, in Canada or in the US. And I know, for instance, that there was one famous Ukrainian, I forgot his name, it was uh, many years ago, hundreds years ago, and he became afterwards a member of this Hall of Fame in Canada because he was the guy who brought all these Ukrainians to Canada. Yeah, And actually, my dream for future is uh, we do need actually uh, an immigration agency uh, for Ukraine, an, an agency that, propo uh, that promotes Ukraine abroad and uh, helps us to attract people from abroad to come to Ukraine. I'm not talking about Ukrainians living abroad for 20 years. It's nonsense to, uh, to tell them, come back home. That's nonsense. But uh, we are all in competition with other countries. Ukraine is a fantastic country with lots of challenges for now, but uh, we can face when we have uh, the, uh, the manpower and the people to do it. And for now, the biggest problem, uh, the biggest problem in Ukraine is uh, the lack of uh, competent people, especially in rural areas, because all the elite left. And many head of the villages they would never be. Uh, they would never have become head of the villages uh, uh, if there had not been this wax of immigration and all people left. And that's the biggest problem for Ukraine. And I hope that European Union also will consider uh, this in their projects, programs, grants, and communication uh, strategies. And hopefully, they will all work more with NGOs and uh, private independent structures and not only with um, governments. I understand that's also needed, but so many money is spent in vain. It's just uh, condensating and doesn't come to the needed uh, places. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. No, very great ideas. Who, want, who wants to continue? I can, I can go ahead. Uh, I've been thinking about this word helping quite a lot. And I'd like to just share a little story. Um, so I work a lot with children. And many of these children come from uh, refugee families. So they've come to Switzerland. Their parents have come to Switzerland as refugees. And, um, and I go at home to them where their parents live and, and they live, their children. And I have turned around my teaching strategy over the past years. And now I'm at the point where I start out by listening. I start out by finding out what are they really interested in? What are they passionate about? What do they want to learn? That's why I start. 
And I'm driven by energy. When I can see a child is energetic about something, this is why I help. This is why I start asking questions. And this is working. So that's my idea about helping. What, what really helping is, it's really listening. It's asking questions and following that energy because that's motivation. And that's where growth comes from. Thank you so much, Frank. We have a comment also from Claudia in the chat. Think about joining Black Sea NGO. Black Sea NGO Forum, that's an um, uh, annual, uh, it used to be in-person conference. Now it's online until, you know, more normal times. Um, that tries to be, bring together NGOs interested in development in the Black Sea region. Um, so, uh, Martin, maybe you, you consider joining and see, see what's uh, going on there. Um, and my final thought, um, and I really appreciate, Frank, your, your um, uh, methods that you shared with us, uh, is um, that, at least from my perspective, uh, in, um, in Romania, in Romanian case, but I think, I suspect it's Eastern Europe, um, we have two layers. One, it's like you mentioned, Frank, we need the local energy and to listen to the people needs. I think that's quite valid. Uh, but what we, we are seeing, especially people doing research in, this, in, in our countries, is that there's a um, skeleton, or the structure uh, of institutions that used to function in a certain way and that have not been restarted properly to function in a democratic uh, context. And those cannot be changed by local interventions or not in our lifetime. So it's a very hard decision for NGOs in Romania to, you know, are we focusing, you know, where the energy comes, where we can see we are really producing change or we can be strategic and really try to make an impact on this structure or on function institutions. Uh, and here is where I think the European Union still has an option to help. They might not, especially in Romanian, you know, Romania being part of European Union, it's considered that we already have a functional structure. Um, and it's everyday struggle for NGOs in Eastern European countries, right? So are we putting the time and energy and little resources that we have in local impact? Or are we trying to really scaling it up and really produce a systemic change. And here is where piloting is so important and support piloting. Because if we have the uh, partners to really encourage piloting, and once we pilot in a few communities, we see this is working, there's a chance for a regional impact that is more than uh, piloting and community change. It's, um, it has the, po uh, the, the power to, to produce policy changes in regional and maybe national level. So it's scaling up the resources, uh, the, the results uh, to really have impactful results uh, and build stronger communities by really building functioning uh, systems for our institutions to, uh, to work properly and really support democratic communities and not really fight against the citizens with at least in our cases happening. Um, if you just one example, because this is so painful, <laughs> if you look at the number of uh, people vaccinated, in Romania, uh, Romania and Bulgaria are at the uh, um, bottom top, uh, bottom <laughs> of the of the list at European uh, level. Though we have all the resources and all the the, the um, um, help, right, that we needed to be successful in in vaccination uh, strategy. So it's it's not all in resources. It's not all in helping, but it has to do with really understanding what people who said they need help actually need. And thank you for organizing such, a, you know, such an interesting topic. Uh, and I'm really help, happy I was able to join. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you for all your contributions. Who wants to continue? I can maybe go on. Um, I want to say that for European Union, I wish, or for Europe, I wish to have more exchange. And we need to see that the exchange is already happening. Young people go abroad, also middle-aged people, old people go abroad, they travel and they spread the, the ideas of open-mindedness and yeah, like European ideas. And if they come back to the home country, whether it's East or West, whatever, they just spread it all over in the family and friends. And 
I like this and it's already happening. And creating Europe is not just over the night. I mean, um, in, in, I'm from Czech Republic and we are in the Europe for, in the European Union for like uh, 20 years. Uh, yeah, 20 years almost. Um, and it's, it's like one generation. So we need more generations to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. Final thoughts of Rune, maybe? Uh, yes, well, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, um, I, th I think it's important that, that we see or learn from each other that we are both alike and have differences and that we can coexist. Um, my only worry is that, that we, we are very much in agreement with that within this room, but what's outside of, of this room? Um, so. <laughs> But um, yeah, I'm just looking forward for the world to open up again uh, so that I can get around at least. So thank you for, for organizing this session. Yeah, thank all of you. Uh, yeah, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, thank you for your great contributions, for taking part in the discussion, for your wonderful insights, Martin and Luna, especially thank, thanks to you. Uh, we have this nice Zoom emojis here, you can clap. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I've seen a lot of opportunities here in this room to cooperate, uh, to share thoughts. So you can also write your email addresses uh, in the chat maybe if you want to. And uh, yeah, so you have each other's contact details. And yeah, I think this is all from my side. Uh, besides one little thing, I sent uh, a link into the chat. It's a short Google form. Uh, only three answers about this session uh, where, can you, where you can leave some comments or maybe some additional thoughts about the future of Europe uh, regarding this topic of the breakout room. And yeah, if, if you could fill it out, it would help us to bring then the ideas to the conference on the future of Europe. And yeah, thank you very much. I wish you a wonderful evening and yeah, stay well, everybody and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.